mode, and then I think that's recording. And well, welcome to our wonderful Friday afternoon at the Manor Speaker Series, and we have a big treat today. And but we're going to have our our wonderful uh, uh, mentor and leader Susan Johnson to intro our our, our afternoon. Over to you, Susan. Thank you. Um, yes, today we're welcoming Anne Lafore and Liliana Vettold to urban study students at the University of Toronto, who've been spending the last couple of months checking out the neighborhood. They're part of their studies and finding out some interesting things about the area because of course we who've lived here a long time have our ideas of what it is and then we sort of find out that no, we're a lot more than that. So ladies, please take it away. Um, okay, so the um, title we kind of came up with for our presentation is Who is My Neighborhood? So kind of encouraging everybody to rethink, um, regardless of what your neighborhood you're in, uh, rethink who's around you and who's living with you. Um, so to introduce ourselves a little bit, um, Susan already uh, prefaced a little bit. So I'm Anne, I'm a third year uh, student. I'm majoring in urban studies and in human geography, um, and Lily. Yeah, I'm Lily. Uh, I am a second year student. I'm majoring in urban studies and public policy. So we are uh, doing, this was a placement that we um, have done for one of our urban studies courses that we're taking together. Um, so we have been spending um, a few hours every week during the semester uh, working on this project. Yeah, so I can start with just a little bit about our topic. Um, part of, or really like the main aspect of our placement was looking at the connections between Manor Road and the Rua Hampton Shelter and sort of how that's situated in the community. Um, specifically, we wanted to examine community reactions to the shelter and explore how the community can support the shelter. So some of the sort of key aspects of our work and what we found to be really important was uh, how citizen participation works in the community how nimbyism and inclusivity function currently and how they might be able to function in the future and the process of community development as it relates to sort of the shelter and to Manor Road as well. Um, so we have a few kind of context slides just to set this um, up against what has been going on in the city. So uh, the city, Toronto kind of has a reputation. Obviously people uh, are very attached to their neighborhoods. Um, neighborhoods are a strong part of the city's identity. People are often like more connected to their sense of their neighborhood than the city itself. Um, and so that uh, is kind of an interesting lens through which to look at these problems because you can really uh, focus in on the community itself and how it does. Um, so. Yeah, another really important piece of context is the housing crisis in Toronto, especially how it has changed and been exacerbated by the pandemic. So these are some statistics on the slide from the Toronto Fallout Report from the Toronto Foundation as of 2020. So more than half of Toronto residents live in what is technically unaffordable housing, which is when you spend more than 30% of your pre-tax income on housing. And 80% of the city's low income residents live in housing considered to be unaffordable. Toronto residents also have more difficulty paying their bills than the rest of residents in cities across Ontario and across the country. Um, and, oh yeah, and you can take this. Um, so the reason this is kind of important is because uh, we kind of identified this housing crisis as one of the root issues, um, which has, led to the housing and shelter crisis in the pandemic. So especially in July and August, so in the months following the beginning of the pandemic, um, there was a major crisis with people not having anywhere to live um, and not having shelter. Um, so the city shelter system is currently at over capacity. So that was the reason for the opening of the Roehampton shelter and kind of the background for it. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's also really important to remember that this sort of is a citywide issue that these, uh, the housing crisis and issues with homelessness and uh, sort of the pandemic, everything else that we've mentioned 
affects every single neighborhood. Every single neighborhood has contended with these issues in some form, be that uh, there's unaffordable housing in the neighborhood or the presence of public and social housing shelters or encampments and the presence of sort of your unhoused neighbors in your community. So that was something that is really key because I think there is a public perception that these issues only affect certain areas of the city, but we found that that's really not true. These issues affect every single neighborhood to some degree and it's present in everybody's lives in some way. So that's important to think about as well. Um, and then a second kind of important aspect of that is that for many people who are experiencing homelessness or poverty in some of the city's wealthier neighborhoods, um, which Midtown is kind of included in that category, there are almost additional challenges for those people because um, there is there tends to be a gap in social services, fewer support networks for low-income uh, people, and this leads to additional issues of isolation and invisibility. Um, so just to quickly go over NIMBYism, because um, it's an acronym that maybe not everybody's familiar with. So NIMBYism is not in my backyard, is what it stands for. Um, so despite the fact that homelessness and poverty exist everywhere in the city, it's often perceived that these are not problems that exist in uh, certain neighborhoods that are generally associated with being wealthier. Um, and so there are often people in these wealthier communities who kind of feel a sense of wanting to keep the original character of the neighborhood of having their, who don't want to really shake up the identity of the neighborhood. Um, and so this typically manifests itself as communities opposing shelters, safe injection sites, subsidized housing um, when they are being built in their neighborhoods. So to speak a little bit about our project, um, which as we said is called sort of who is my neighborhood, we again are really focusing on the connections and the support that exists between Manor Road and the Roehampton shelter. We are examining how the shelter has sort of set up roots in the community and how the community can be a basis of support for the shelter. Um, we're also looking at challenges that face the shelter in the community, which is going to relate a little bit to the nimbyism that Anne just discussed. But as well as challenges, there are also a lot of opportunities in the community to support the shelter and its residents. So we'll be talking about those as well. Um, so the Roehampton opening was kind of the center point for our analysis on um, inclusivity and welcoming in the community. Um, so a little bit of background. So the shelter was opened as we uh, said before um, in response to the housing crisis, which was exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and so the shelter, we've been uh, meeting with uh, Eartha Downey, who's the program coordinator at the shelter. So we've had some very uh, interesting meetings with her um, where she described the shelter as uh, working on a community, sorry, on a, <laughs> in a community, like it's a, a community engagement model. So it depends on the community support and enthusiasm and help for the shelter to operate effectively and to ensure its success. Um, so when we were kind of thinking about how can the community, the residents, community organizations better support the shelter, uh, this became very central. Um, so we kind of identified community resistance against the shelter as one of its, the main threats to its success. Um, so we came up with some research questions which would focus on how we could increase support for the shelter and enable its success. Um, and have its well residents welcomed and integrated into the community. So these are kind of our guiding questions. Um, so what does it mean to be an inclusive community and what does creating an inclusive, inclusive community involve? And then how can NIMB NIMBYism be addressed within the context of community participation? So these are the questions that have kind of guided everything that we are going to talk about. So for sort of our research and just our process, um, we looked into the history of the Midtown neighborhood and uh, we spoke a lot about it with uh, Roman JJ and we also uh, examined some census data. We looked at primary data. We went on walks through the neighborhood just to sort of get familiar with it um, because neither of us actually are residents of the Midtown neighborhood. And then we also did a lot of media analysis. So this involved looking at newspaper articles about the community also about the opening of the shelter, uh, looking at social media as well was really big. And finally, we looked at some academic texts and articles to sort of understand 
urban planning theories and uh, a little bit of human geography theory as well and how that might apply to the context of the community. Um, so obviously we wanted to have a little bit of context first. So we uh, did a bit of research into the history of the neighborhood. So I believe this is at the corner of Mount Pleasant and Davisville, but don't quote me on that. It was <laughs> difficult to find the source, but so the land is the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, and the neighborhood itself, so uh, Davisville Village, as it was called originally, was founded in 1840. Um, and then starting in the 1920s and 30s, as the city was growing, this midtown neighborhood um, was almost entirely filled with single family homes, which meant that as the 20th century progressed, it kind of became one of the wealthier uh, communities of the city and um, has al also been associated with um, kind of a wasp culture and it's been a kind of a white upper class neighborhood for a long time. Um, and so part of our work was kind of questioning whether that's an identity that needs to be challenged. Is it still reflective of who's living in the neighborhood and is that where the future of the neighborhood is going. So here are just some photos that we took from walking around the neighborhood. Um, as you can see, these were taken a while ago when it was very snowy, but we have one of the Hatch at the Manor. We have some of just other forms of community engagement, the library boxes and promotional posters from the BIA. So I think that these are just sort of images that speak to the character of the neighborhood. And I know that going there really helped me sort of like understand and ground our work in the actual physical community itself. Um, so after studying the history of the neighborhood and walking around it, we kind of got some context in our own ideas about the neighborhood. Um, and so one thing we thought was important to do was look at the 2016 census data um, for the neighborhood to see if the actual neighborhood demographics were properly represented in the neighborhood's identity. Um, so these are the two census tracts that we kind of uh, labeled as the borders of the neighborhood. Um, so we have Blythewood to the north, uh, Bayview to the east, kind of Moore and Glen Elm to the south, and then Young Street to the west. So these are kind of the boundaries that we're working within. Um, Obviously the census tracts are not necessarily always representative of the true borders of the neighborhood. So this is kind of flexible, um, but just studying a little studying. Um, so the visible minority population in Mount Pleasant West and East is actually like higher than I think a lot of people would expect. So 33%, so um, one in three people in Mount Pleasant West, especially. Um, which kind of challenges the associations with whiteness of the neighborhood that I think a lot of people in the city uh, maintain. Um, and the low income population is also um, quite high, 23% in Mount Pleasant West, especially. Um, and so unaffordable housing as well, 41%. So this in Mount Pleasant West, that's actually higher than the city average. Um, and Mount Pleasant East is just a little bit below the city average, which is 31%. Um, and then inadequate housing. So this is any households with insufficient bedrooms for the number of residents uh, living in them. So this quite extreme housing situations where there's really not enough room um, for the people who are living there. Um, so that's even higher Mount Pleasant East um, at 9.7%. So one in 10 people is living in an inadequate housing. Um, and then the median household income, um, Mount Pleasant East is very high and obviously associated with it's quite, quite a wealthy area. And then Mount Pleasant West, we see that it's not necessarily, it's actually lower than the Toronto city median. So um, that kind of leads us to some questions about whether our sense of the neighborhood as a wealthy area, as a strictly wealthy area should be challenged. Um, so a second thing that we looked at was the Midtown Community Services and Facilities Strategy. So this is a municipal report that is published. It hasn't, they haven't updated it since 2018. So that's the version that we're using. Um, and what they do is kind of neighborhood by neighborhood um, assess the community services and facilities 
to consider whether they are adequately serving the community or not. Um, so this is kind of an interesting thing because a lot of the times the uh, services and programs that are available reflect what people um, see the neighborhood as needing. So um, interestingly, the la there's in the patch of uh, apartments northeast of Young and Eglinton, actually along Roehampton, um, there's kind of a patch of low lower income apartment buildings where there's a concentration of lower income families living in the neighborhood. And it's in that area where there's a very marked gap of childcare services. Um, so it's clear that there's some underserving of community services and facilities in the lower income side of the neighborhood. Um, and then another interesting thing, which was uh, important to consider, especially in relation to the Roehampton shelter, is that the neighborhood scores very highly in schools, libraries, community spaces, parks, all of the things that are, of course, very great to have and that are very reflective of a strong community. Um, but things like homelessness services, employment aid, um, immigration services, medical and disability services, so services that are more targeted at vulnerable populations were lacking in the neighborhood and especially in terms of the visibility. So if you walk, and this was something that I noticed um, walking around the neighborhood, if you walk up or down Mount Pleasant or Bayview, um, there are lots of restaurants and lots of yoga studios and daycares and bakeries um, and not so many social services that are targeted at these more vulnerable populations. Um, so this is kind of the services that are available are kind of reflective of the way the community sees itself. Um, and so that's kind of a... Yeah, so something that's also really important is to consider, as Anne touched on a little bit, what this tells us about neighborhood identity, how maybe the neighborhood sees itself, where the neighborhood, where sort of the priorities lie. A lot of that is, you can really, I think, see that when you examine what services are available, uh, what events go on in the neighborhood, all that kind of stuff. Um, so now this was kind of our, the beginning of our uh, analysis, which we started with looking at all of the community reactions to the opening of the Roehampton shelter. Um, so these were taken from Twitter, uh, where we kind of did a scan under all of the comments um, of the media articles posted. So we kind of scanned through them and to see what the general sense was. So I won't read all of these out loud because they're not necessarily my views, but um, these are some of the things said by community members. Um, and then we'll show some positive ones as well. Um, so you can kind of compare and contrast these two views and these are all comments made by neighborhood residents. Um, and this kind of, kind of shows us that there is a wide range of reactions to the shelter. There's obviously so many people in the neighborhood who have been very welcoming and inclusive and have done their best to support the shelter. And so our main focus um, in furthering the support for the shelter is kind of addressing the negative reactions and um, seeing how those can be turned into something more positive. So here are uh, some of the really positive reactions and the really positive action that we've seen come from the community in a response to the shelters. So there have been food drives, preparing meals, uh, knitting hats and socks, other clothes for the residents, and a lot of community building projects as well, like Midtown's Got Talent, I know it took place maybe a couple weeks or a month ago. Um, so that has all been really, really great to see. A lot of that has also been supported by Manor Road, so that's been great. And these have had some really positive effects on the community. So it is fostering the creation of inclusive spaces for shelter residents in the neighborhood. And it's giving support for the shelter's operations. As we said, since the shelter is really based around this community engagement model, it is super, super important that they have support directly from the residents of the neighborhood. Um, and then in terms of more negative reaction, reactions to the shelter. Um, so one of the main things that um, has been done, and I'm sure maybe some of you have seen it, is the Midtown Toronto Community Safety Group, which operates primarily on Facebook. Um, they have close to 5,000 members. And so this is a group that 
whose um, only focus, like the, the, their title is kind of broad, but they are hyper-focused on the shelter and on the uh, homelessness crisis in the neighborhood. Um, so we actually tried to get access to the group. It's a private group on Facebook and um, we were not able to join the group, um, which kind of speaks to the uh, privacy of these opinions and maybe that tells you something about them. But um, some of the activities in this group that we've heard from uh, other sources is uh, targeting homeless people who look homeless in the street People have taken pictures of them, reported homeless people sitting in the park, um, tracing them down, et cetera. Um, and then part of what this group has also done is uh, send formal complaints to the Toronto Police Services, to city councillors, to shelter organizers, um, making their voices heard. Um, and so the effects on the community have been kind of varied from this group. So there's been the creation in response to their opposition, there's been the creation of the Midtown uh, Safety Plan and the School Safety Plan, um, which both basically address the concerns that the shelter is near a few of the schools in the neighborhood. Um, and so it includes things like um, having city staff on site at schools to uh, do a scan of the schoolyard before school, checking for needles, et cetera. Um, but one of the more negative impacts it's had is that it's created a fairly hostile environment for the shelter residents. So we've heard from some shelter residents in interviews that they don't feel that the neighborhood is welcoming them or that the neighborhood that many of the residents want them there. Um, so, um, but what we can see, uh, regardless of the opinions on both sides, what it kind of shows us is that there are very high levels of resident engagement on both sides. Um, so unfortunately, due to the passion and commitment that people have for this community, which is a great thing, that's actually kind of heightened the conflict between the two groups because people feel so strongly about um, their neighborhoods. And at the end of the day, both of the groups um, are genuinely working towards their vision of a great, safe neighborhood. So. Um, there's an interesting conflict there. So we have, um, on one side, there's those whose vision of community involves preserving a certain idea of what the neighborhood is and who lives there. So those are obviously the people who are um, more hesitant about the shelter. Not all of them are opposed to the shelter totally, but it's those who are more hesitant to its effects and how it may impact the community. And then there are those whose sense of what a community is, is guided by being welcoming and inclusive um, to everybody. So those are obviously the people, um, and there are many, many, many of them in the neighborhood who are more focused on ensuring that the shelter's residents are properly included and integrated into the community. Um, so this is a short, I won't play the whole thing, but this is just a news uh, report from the summer when the protests uh, about the shelter was happening. So there is on one side of the street, um, the original protest was, which was in opposition to the shelter. And then um, a counter protest was started in response to that with people who we were advocating for the shelter. Um, so I'll just play about a minute from that after this short commercial. <laughs> We're not getting any sound, eh? John Joseph, you're muted too. Okay, that's not helpful. And did you share your sound? Oh, sorry, is the sound not on? So what you might need to do is pause the video and then um, stop sharing.
Then when you go back to the sharing, you have to share sound and, and audio. Okay, sorry, I thought this sound was playing the whole thing. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Damage the brain. Can you hear it now? We're just yeah. overwhelming and we couldn't, we weren't able to just to pace it through. It's a great neighborhood. There's space for more people and it should be welcoming. This is an absolute us versus them thing. Posters with messages like safety over fear, chanting. Tensions are high between two groups who came to rally in Midtown today. Residents living in the neighborhood voicing their safety concerns about temporary homeless shelters which have opened up in the area in recent months. Others in support of the housing program, saying homeless individuals also deserve dignity and care. The simultaneous demonstrations are over three buildings, the Roehampton Hotel and two former residential buildings on Broadway Avenue. The city took them over to house people during COVID-19. The latter two will shut down at the end of the month. The hotel, however, has been leased for two years. This is about the crimes that have been happening in our neighborhood. Local residents say there's been an alarming spike in concerning behavior, like needles on the ground and an increase in crime in the area, including the stabbing of a city social worker in one of the shelters a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so I'll stop it there because the rest um, kind of deviates off topic a little bit. Um, but that kind of gives you a sense that of the sentiments on both sides um, and how they are a little bit more nuanced than um, those who want to help and those who don't. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, so obviously from the video, um, we can see that a lot of the people who are protesting the shelter were driven by concern um, for their children, for the community, for the safety of the schools, et cetera. Um, so a lot of them can be considered well-intentioned, um, I guess, but what's kind of an important thing to remember is that um, there actually was no, the Toronto police came out um, the same week that this protest took place and actually made a statement that there had not been an increase in crime at all in the neighborhood um, after the opening of the shelter. And that in fact, they had received significantly more calls with complaints about um, people in the neighborhood and behaviors which were unfounded. And so it kind of shows that um, a lot of these Reactions are driven by prejudice and misconceptions, fear, um, miseducation on who's living in the shelter, um, et cetera. So something that we think is really important is we're drawing sort of on a little bit of urban theory here about this concept of the right to the city it has a lot of bearing sort of on this discussion. So the right to the city is an idea that was elaborated on a lot by David Harvey. Um, there's sort of a big quote here on the slide, which is from his book, Rebel Cities, which is really good. I definitely recommend it. And um, it is sort of the idea that the right to the city is the right to have a say in how the city is shaped or the right to participate in building the city in accordance with your own vision or on a larger scale, the right of the community to sort of change and shape the city as they would like to. So I think that this really sort of applies to the conflicts that has been playing out over the shelter because we see um, sort of this opposing ideas of right to the city for shelter residents and right to the city in terms of community engagement. And we see that both of these groups like sort of in that protest on either side, both have a very strong idea about how they would like the city to be shaped. But it's also really important to consider which of these groups has more power to shape the city and how shelter residents actually have very little power to access their right to the city and to shape the city at all. So when we're considering who has a right to change a community in accordance with their own vision, we also have to consider who is simply unable to change the community in accordance with their vision and sort of what we might be able to do if we could put some of those blocks down and everybody could access this right to sort of shape the community according to their desires. Um, and then also for the, uh, for those who are in opposition to the shelter, um, one of the, 
next slide. Um, we have seen that resident engagement and opportunities for participation and consultation. In the video, there was, um, you heard one woman who was saying that she would have liked to be consulted about what was happening. Um, so this was, we found a driver of a lot of the opposition um, is the lack of involvement and consultation that residents had. So part of what happened was because of the pandemic and the fact that this was almost built as an emergency shelter to deal with the housing crisis, um, a lot of the typical development steps were fast-tracked or skipped over entirely. So things like town hall meetings, um, community um, like question periods, et cetera, we were skipped over. So residents who would usually be more involved in the placement of the shelter and its opening were not very um, involved. And so some people complained that they didn't even know that the shelter was going, was opening until they walked by it and saw it for themselves. Um, so this is, given how central it is to a lot of the opposition, this is kind of the lens through which we are looking at how we can build, how we can find solutions. So something that really plays into that is this idea of a ladder of citizen participation. So um, these rungs each represent a way that the city or uh, a country, even on a larger scale, invites citizens to participate in the building of you know, new community centers or uh, roads, just sort of generally how the physical community is shaped or community initiatives as well. So on the lower rungs where you have uh, sort of these five in the red and yellow zone, I'll call them, um, where citizens actually have very little power, either they are not consulted or um, they're consulted in sort of a very surface level way where their thoughts and their feelings about changes are not really taken into consideration. Um, and then up at the top where you have citizen control, delegated power and partnership, these are really high degrees of citizen power where people have a great deal of access to their right to the city. What citizens say about their community really matters. So what we found is that the uh, city's sort of rushing of the community consultation process and use of these methods on the lower rungs of the ladder as opposed to the rungs on the higher, the opposed to the higher rungs of the ladder is what led to a lot of the frustration around the building of the shelter, a lot of the opposition to the building of the shelter and sort of a little bit of like misplaced anger as well. Um, so from that conclusion, we kind of were able to essentially uh, divide the shelter opposition into two categories. So there's type one, which is the people who um, were in opposition to the existence of the shelter or any homeless shelter in the neighborhood who felt that this was the kind of thing that belonged in other communities, typically poor ones in the city. Um, and so like this is reflected in some of the Twitter comments that we had above, um, which were um, not really about being involved and that were really about kind of a prejudice against uh, homeless people and those uh, in more precarious or in situations of poverty that they didn't want in their neighborhood. And then the second type were those who were not necessarily opposed to the opening of the shelter and who weren't necessarily opposed to supporting the shelter, but who were frustrated by the lack of consultation and communication um, from the city and who wanted to be more involved in the planning process. So these are kind of the two types that we broke down um, so that we could kind of figure out solutions that would target each of those. Um, so basically these are four types of solutions um, which are based on the principles of citizen participation since we've seen that this is such an important part um, of supporting the shelter. So for type one, which um, are those who um, were against the shelter actually being in the neighborhood, the two most effective ways to deal with that are community education. So obviously we can see that a lot of the um, fear or opposition to the shelter is driven out of um, not necessarily being educated on who is in the shelter. So some of those Twitter comments said things like, um, oh, people who had just been gotten out of jail, prostitutes, et cetera, um, where they're kind of making generalizations or assumptions about 
what kind of, who is uh, living here and what kind of impact they'll have on their neighborhoods. So an effective way to kind of deal with that is to um, increase the level of communication and education that's going out to the residents. Um, and then the second thing is concessions and incentives. So um, this one has been kind of a little bit debated because it does involve some give and take from both parties, but um, this has actually happened with the Roehampton shelter a little bit where they, they increased security at one point to um, kind of try to increase satisfaction in the neighborhood. And um, yeah, so just a little bit of a give and take to keep everybody a little bit happy. So in some um, other cities, other things that have been done have been like um, changing like curfew times, increasing security, changing certain ways um, that the shelter operates so that it can kind of fit into the city better. And then type two, which is um, kind of solutions for those who do, didn't feel that they were involved enough. Obviously these solutions are targeted at involving, getting people more involved and um, integrated into the planning process. So through community outreach and community advisory boards. Um, which can look like a lot of different things, um, whether that's just um, getting people to volunteer and um, help support and then have um, citizens have a certain level of decision-making power to so they feel more empowered. So uh, some of our key findings are listed here. We've already discussed it a little bit, but um, we know that the opening of the shelter really heightened a lot of uh, tensions existing in the neighborhood and highlighted the issues that arise when neighborhood when residents have competing visions for what they want their neighborhood to look like. Um, and as Anne said, by addressing NIMBYism in the neighborhood through a lens of citizen participation and as well through other solutions that she mentioned, uh, we can create a more inclusive community. I think really the main thing that we found was that a lot of the opposition to the shelter comes from a place of really deeply caring about as we saw at the protest, a lot of the signs um, were about like protecting seniors or protecting children. So there is a lot of care and a lot of passion about having a safe community and building a really beautiful community. And I think that with education and with um, really doing concerted outreach, we can take that those sentiments that have previously driven really negative responses and we can turn them into something that hopefully is really positive. Yeah, so I think that's also like moving forward that that kind of um, builds in a role for community organizations and residents because these are all solutions that are very focused on um, community action. So it's not things that are coming from the outside, not things that are coming from the municipal or provincial government or from outside agencies. Like these are really like um, trying to build these kinds of solutions into the actual fabric of the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we've been working on for the past couple months. Um, so if anybody has any comments, questions, thoughts, discussions, anything, um, I'm happy to hear them. Oh, I think you're muted. Can you stop sharing for a second just so we can then have everyone's face up and okay, perfect. Great. So any comments or questions, everybody? Uh, Peter and Gary have a- Peter and Gary, okay. Yes, very, very comprehensive work. I commend you for that. And very, uh, very in depth. Um, from the little that I know about, you know, shelters, community housing. Uh, to, I mean, it may be just the way I'm looking at it from what I know, what I see on media. The city is almost, um, in the way of, of, of progress in a lot of ways, uh, where people want to help, uh, you know, when people go to the city to, that they want to help, they see this huge bureaucracy and they run the other way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's interesting you bring that up because one of the things that I was, that I was kind of on my mind while we were working on this was, um, Khalil Brown, who is um, a contractor in the city who's uh, started a project during the pandemic of building um, kind of tiny wooden homes, shelters, 
um, for the city's homeless and um, due to bureaucratic processes and kind of the complicated nature of working with the city, the city um, forced him to abandon that project. So they didn't really offer any solutions instead. So what they really ended up happening was that people were not given shelter because uh, the city couldn't really find a way to work with uh, Khalil Brown, this man, um, in a way that kind of fit their complicated uh, quotas and processes, et cetera. And it actually had a detrimental effect um, mm -hmm. on the city's homeless. Looking at um, sort of the, oh, go ahead. Um, looking at sort of the literature around this issue as well, we found that a lot of the time people who are in opposition to the shelter are actually people who are involved in their community in a number of other ways or are sort of really like sort of liberal people just use that term. And mm -hmm. sometimes frustration with the shelter comes from feeling that it's not a long-term solution to homelessness or feeling that the city is not sort of attacking the problem of homelessness at the root and is instead sort of doing these like band-aid procedures. So yeah. a lot of frustration comes from there as well. I definitely feel that way as well. It's like a band-aid. Yeah. A band-aid solution. Yeah. And people get very frustrated because they're like, well, why are you doing something that they see as damaging to their community? And they see it as sort of like, why would you put up 50 temporary shelters across the city as opposed to maybe working on affordable housing? So that's been also sort of a point of yeah. contention. Excellent. Yeah. Affordable housing is very much needed in this city. Mm -hmm. And the city is still a mosaic. And um, I don't know, just, I don't know how, even in, well, we'll call them the lesser areas, like, for example, Jane and Finch, the housing is not affordable here anymore. <laughs> you know, a two bedroom apartment in not the greatest of buildings is $1,700 a month. So, Totally. Where is the affordable housing coming in? You know, I mean, Jane and Finch is on the lower scale. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and when we think about how the pandemic has affected people's ability to pay their bills and mm -hmm. sort of oh. that was really, I think, something that pushed a lot of people over the precipice because when housing is so expensive, it really doesn't take very much for you to not be able to pay rent or for you to not be able to pay your mortgage for you to lose your home. It's a very, I think it was, it was a lot more of a precarious situation than we realized. And with the pandemic, sort of, that was a tipping point for a lot of people to really need housing support that they discovered just does not really exist in the city. Okay, so the shelters are a temporary measure. It does get the people off the streets. Till we get through this pandemic and get to the other side. But I think going forward, now we have to address the affordable housing. Yeah. You know, like get these people out of the shelters now into a place that's affordable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in Jane and Finch, there's a lot of Toronto community housing, but um, a lot of it's going to be torn down and condos are being built and yeah. unaffordable condos. Yeah, well, that's well, even something that we that's, that's going to be like a big housing crisis. Uh, anyone uh, else? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, it's absolutely like it's it's uh, difficult to kind of think, well, this is just a Band-Aid solution. But right now it's a necessary Band-Aid solution because they exactly. also have people out on the streets, which is um, very dehumanizing. There's no positives to it. Um, so it's kind of difficult to navigate that about how much how much effort and how much support do we um, do we have for these band-aid solutions when really we want to be working towards something more permanent and more effective. So and can you are you finding that there's resistance in well, I guess in the areas called Davisville? And is there like a lot of resistance to this? these shelters. I'm sorry, I came in late because I didn't have the correct link. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, there, um, I don't know when you came in, but the, um, 
once the when the shelters were announced, especially in the early months um, of the shelters opening, there was a lot of backlash against it, both on social media, protests in the street, um, people targeting the shelters residents and kind of harassing them, following them around, taking pictures of them, um, people reporting uh, the residents to the police when they weren't actually committing crimes, they were just living. Right. Um, so there was, yeah, quite a bit of um, opposition and contention there. So can you comment on, uh, there's, there was a piece in the CVC uh, ideas program about uh, the renewal of a of shared accommodation and as something that was the norm. And then in the eighties, it was certainly the norm and it was, I mean, there were condos that were built with two separate units, one at each end of the condo where you'd have bedrooms, the idea of sharing that. And that, do you think if we address the immediate need for, is building things takes a long time, of shifting to how many people can live together and maybe making an incentive for people to do that and how to, how to go about that? Is that yeah. It? Do you, I think, do you think that sorry, go ahead. Sorry. One really big issue in that regard is zoning, where zoning yeah. in Toronto a lot of the times yeah. is very much not friendly to co-op housing, to right. shared housing, or sort of like more creative or like less traditional methods of housing than like a house with two bedrooms or a condo with right. one bedroom. So I think that that is going to be something that we really have to confront is how can we sort of adapt these creative solutions like co-op housing while also dealing with a lot of the sort of bureaucratic and legal restrictions that's in the way and then i think the other part of that sorry is the is cultural aspect where um like my grandmother lives in north york up at like finch and bathurst and around there lately um people start have started calling the monster homes where there are families of like three or four maybe five people living in huge six or seven bedroom houses um and it's it's totally unsustainable. And it's easy to see that within five or 10, those buildings are gonna have to be occupied by multiple families just as the population grows. Like it's just not a way that we can continue to expand our city that way. Like people are gonna have to get used to living in smaller spaces and sharing because, and that's kind of part of the urban experience as well. So, so can you comment? So there was, if you think of it, two areas of the city, one had the High Park Roncesville area, which was called Polish Harlem way back, and the Rosedale, two areas where they were uh, built as single family homes. And then they became multi, uh, not families, but multi dwell, multi, multi flats or whatever you want to call it. And then apparently in Rosedale, it, in the 50s, it was the norm. Friends of mine actually own one in Rosedale where it's still got 20 apartments, which uh, based on your what you're saying about this one, would never be allowed. Yeah, I think I think Joanne had a comment. Joanne. Oh, I was just going to say you mentioned um, the idea of uh, a sustainable arrangement, and I think sustainability is another big piece that Toronto is needing to address, like sooner than later, like getting a proper like. There, there are ways that, that Toronto's doing a really good job, you know, the amount of green space, the availability of the bike program that's, it's not everywhere, unfortunately, but it's there. Like, so I think there's lots of ways that Toronto, lots of things that Toronto needs to concentrate on that will make it a more livable city. And one of them is, is like this transportation system, like construction business that never seems to end. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the Especially up here. <laughs> that people need some place to live that doesn't cost a million dollars. The fact that, you know, um, our air is messed up. The fact that it, it costs a lot of money for an individual, I just found this out recently, for an individual to, to, to get alternative energy, like to put solar panels on their roof of their house. Like it costs a lot of, it's an un, it's an undoable thing. They're, it's like they have these goals, these notions of this um, green city or sustainability or whatever, but they they seem either unable or unwilling to make the leap forward to to get there. Like it, it has to happen, you know. It can't just be this like pie in the sky, you know, zero emissions by twenty fifty or whatever. It's like mm, 
Maybe it's now that this needs to happen. I think that's where the conflict comes in between, you know, sort of the existing neighborhoods and, and you know, new ideas coming in. It's like you can't be afraid. Change has to happen. Well, De you know, a comment, yeah. one, one thing that um, is very notable is, okay, so I need a new car. I'd like to buy an electric car because that's the best way to go for the environment and especially in the city. But if you're just renting an apartment, you don't have access to charge it mm -hmm. overnight. So, I mean, that's gonna be another issue that the city's gonna have to deal with. You know, I mean, because we should all be switching to electric, you know, and get rid of the gas. Yeah, I think a lot of it actually really goes back to um, sort of what Peter and Gary said about the city getting in the way of actual progress. I think that it's really very difficult to make a lot of these changes that like we know are necessary or that we know would be helpful because we're trying to do them within this framework of really outdated legal and bureaucratic practices. So I think that is something that has been really, really frustrating to a lot of people who want to see good things happen. And I think the political piece is interesting too. Um, like Toronto has had kind of a series now of fairly conservative mayors who are appealing to a certain suburban demographic in a lot of ways, um, which I think has been one of the main impediments to building a better transport system is that a lot of uh, commuters from the suburbs um, don't want toll highways. They like you at the end of the day, um, sustainable infrastructure and those kinds of developments. Um, are absolutely worth it in the long run, but that there has to be some kind of money put into them up front and that um, if you don't have the political support for it in the city, which is often an issue, um, it's kind of difficult to get past that step. Yeah, I also think it's really interesting that a lot of the times these um, political figures are appealing to demographics that we are seeing don't almost don't really exist anymore. Like even if the demographics that we included in our presentation they were really surprising to me when I first found those out that one in three people in sort of uh, Eglinton West is like a visibly racialized person, that there are these high rates of people living in economically precarious situations. I think that our communities are really changing. They're becoming more diverse. The economic situations are becoming more diverse, but we are still appealing to these suburban areas as if they are all white and all upper middle class. And so I think that that has been a really interesting conflict as well. Can you guys point to any um, communities, cities, maybe I missed it because I came in late too, kind of like Debbie, maybe not, I don't know how, when I came in, but um, I'm wondering if you can point to any cities that are doing a really good job. Is there one of those, of, um, you know, how people sometimes will say, oh, Denmark is awesome because whatever. I'm just wondering. Exactly. Um. <laughs> you don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's kind of interesting because it's hard to find cities where ev where everything is going well. Like obviously in every city they do well, like we do well in our in green spaces and on our parks, we are known for that and we're known for being a fairly livable city, but we obviously have a lot of issues. So it's kind of interesting um, to see, like New York has done a lot for bike lanes recently. And I know a lot of um, cities in Korea and Japan have been really working on their public transport systems and have like developed them as much as we've grown our like as much as the TPC has been uh, grown in the last 30 years has been done in the past three years in some Korean cities. Um, so it's kind of drawing from uh, what everybody's doing and then like for the affordable housing thing I think um, a few cities in Scandinavia and then there's uh, quite a few cities in Spain actually too that have kind of um, worked on smaller scale housing units for affordability. Um, I also think that um, moving beyond just like big cities we can look at specific uh, community organizations that are doing really great things to support housing and to support uh, their homeless neighbors as well. I know that in Toronto uh, the encampment support network has been doing a really great job of supporting um, a lot of the people who are living on the street, they're not living in shelters. And that's been sort of a really big issue that also goes back to what Anne was talking about earlier with Khalil Brown and the tiny shelters. So I think that a lot of cities that have a really strong 
wellspring of like these community organizations that are very eager to help their neighbors are doing super, super well in terms of providing support for people, whether that is support that is coming from residents of the city or support that's coming from sort of city infrastructure and political positions. Any other questions from people? Just uh, mm -hmm. my observation, part of the problem, I don't know if it's just Toronto or Ontario or off Canada, we overthink things. It, it, it's the, the whole what's been happening with COVID, perfect example. It, it's let's make sure we get it in one instead of, I don't know, but it just seems to me that everything we do takes too long. Yeah. It I does. Think. And you know what? And the virus is changing and we're not onto it. They knew about the virus changing two months ago, but they weren't onto it, you know, like, so now we're seeing this uprise again. And, uh, well, I don't know. Just have to keep our faith, I guess. Um, yeah, I think the vaccine rollout is kind of a, a good illustration of how our government sometimes spends so long thinking about things. And then sometimes you just have to yeah. kind of act and get things out there and done. Yeah, I think it's very much sort of all comes razor where like sometimes the very simplest thing to do, like, you know, we have all of these empty housing units in the city and we have all these people who don't have a home, like the simplest solution is just put people in the homes like that really does work and it's been proven to work other places. So I think a lot of the times there is a lot of sort of bureaucratic dithering around and the solution is very much just the simplest thing that we can think of. Okay, so when it comes to the homeless though, um, okay, so we give them a shelter to live in, um, but will they actually stay? You know what I mean? Because homeless people, they tend to like to wander. You know, That's so. actually, yeah, that was a big issue is that a lot of people don't actually want to leave encampments and go to shelters. A lot of that times that's because shelters tend to have really, really restrictive regulations. A lot of people, if they have like a pet, like a dog and the shelter won't allow them to keep their dog, that is a big barrier. Another really big barrier is that a lot of shelters don't offer um, like services. So I know that the Roehampton shelter does have like, you have access to mental health services and you have access to addiction services when you're living on site, but a lot of shelters don't have that. And so for a homeless person to leave sort of their other community of people that they know on the street who provide them support and move into a shelter where there's no support, that can also be a big barrier for them wanting to uh, live in a shelter as opposed to wanting to stay like say in an encampment. And the shelters have had a very bad rap yeah yeah they, as well. you know a lot of the homeless people don't want to go into the shelters because they have bed bugs you know what i mean like they're not maybe maintained very well and um you know that's another issue like are they keeping it up or not So you like, raise, Debbie, you raise a lot of questions. Part of it is some shelters do have that, yes. But shelters are also meant to be temporary. As we see, certainly as a reminder in this Roehampton shelter, as people are moving into more permanent housing. Uh, an example of a shelter that was ne never intended to be a permanent dwelling was Seton House. It's a 600 bed facility. That was a disaster. People were living there 30 years. It was meant to be a temporary shelter. But I think, I, I, I think the key part is, we, we this this uh, presentation helps open the, the way to ask the bigger questions. I mean, yesterday we had a, a national vigil uh, for guaranteed liv livable income. Uh, so, which is again another question altogether, which relates to this. But but it, I think what what the whole uh, pandemic time is causing us to do is rethink how we engage in community and what that means for us right now. Yeah. So, uh, any more comments or questions from anyone? Well, I want to say uh, it's, been, it's been a delight, Liliana and Anne, and, uh, and and Susan. You want to close us up and do, remind us who, who's who's on for next week? Ah, you always catch me with that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be somebody awesome. But thank you all for coming. And um, John and Joseph, if you know who it is next week, please tell us. But I hope to see everybody again. 
One, one second. Let me just. Oh, I think it's Victor. Victor Carradine, our Toronto Heritage person. Oh, yeah. Oh. That, that's what I think it is. Okay. Thank you, every. Thank you, well, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Be well. Go thank for a walk. You. Bye bye. Bye.